Oh. Ooh. Ew. Hmm. <laughs> Hello whiskey fans, today I'm going to be taking a look at a whiskey that you might have heard of because it's famous, as it says on the bottle there, the famous Gross is one of the biggest whiskey brands in Scotland, in the UK and in the entire world. There's a good chance that a lot of you people watching at home will have not only had this whiskey but there's uh, going to be a fair few of you for whom this is going to be your first taste of whiskey your first step into the world of whiskey that probably led on to single malts. I've actually had a lot of people tell me that they've been to the famous Gross distillery and this tends to be non-whiskey drinkers, people that have been to Scotland on holiday and they've seen the famous Gross experience and they've signed up, gone through the museum, done the tour, learned a bit about whiskey, maybe tried some and come away thinking that they've been to the, the famous Gross distillery, but there is actually no such place. The famous Gross experience is a very popular tourist attraction at the Glen Turret distillery, which is owned by Edrington, which is the company that produces famous Gross, as well as Glen Turret single malt. There are a number of other whiskies that are associated with famous Gross, often going into their products, and amongst those there is Highland Park, which often features quite strongly in some of the, especially some of the other expressions of Famous Gross, the Macallan, and Glenrothes as well. But it must be said that the Famous Gross is a blended scotch, so from that we know that there's at least one single malt and at least one grain whiskey that goes into the standard expression. And we also know from Edrington that the standard famous gross blend is at least 65% grain whiskey. So that is reflected in the price point. Here in the UK you can pick up a full size 70 centiliter bottle of the famous gross in most places for under £15 usually, so very cheap. But we know that price isn't always attached to quality. So I'm going to get straight to the point and I'm going to see what we've got in the glass here. There's something nostalgic about having a famous gross. And it probably goes for a lot of people. Because as I said, a lot of people will have started off in the world of whiskey and probably even spirits. Because famous gross is so widespread, it's going to be hard to find someone that hasn't had it. What is nice about the nose of Famous Gross is there is a little tiny hint of smokiness there, possibly coming from Highland Park. I must admit that, like most people, I don't tend to drink that much blended whiskey. But in terms of sales, it has to be said that Famous Gross are doing something right. So I'm also getting heavy notes of caramel in there, which is something that you quite often get with blended whiskey. can actually be an indication that a whiskey has been heavily blended. And you get it in single malts as well. When you get lots of different casks that all have their own character and they pull and push with each other. And you can end up with... Uh, almost a drowned out caramel note that replaces all of the individuality of all the different casks. Which is one of the reasons why if you are going to go for blended whiskey you would generally go for a blended malt. So aside from that caramel I'm getting some sort of toffeed grain notes. And when I say grain I mean Grain, as in grain whiskey, as well as you are 
you have got some evidence there that this is distilled from barley. You can smell that there is some barley influence in there. But it has to be said that, as you might expect for this price point, there are quite some spirity, harsh notes in there as well. Almost acetone. There is a chemical, immature note in the nose there, it has to be said. But also I think there is evidence that some sherry casks have gone into this as well. Absolutely by no means a sherry bomb. You have to look for it. But you can tell that Edrington have put some thought into producing this whiskey. So I'm going to go ahead and try out the palette. So as you might expect, being bottled at 40%, this is not a full flavoured whiskey. It's not enormously underpowered, but it is on the weak side. And again, you, you can taste that there is that immaturity to the whiskey. You can taste you can taste the grain whiskey in there. And again a little bit of a chemical you note. Know. As for the finish, I'm getting there is a lingering bitter note to this whiskey. And even though it is a mild whiskey, almost a little bit underpowered, as to be said. There is a lingering alcohol kick, a little bit of heat that sticks with you on the palate there, long after the flavour has died off, to be honest. What I will also say is you have to be wary of these little miniatures. I am reasonably familiar with the famous Grice. I've bought more than one bottle in my time, and I will say that what you get in the miniatures tends to be a little bit above par. <laughs> and I've seen, seen that with lots of distilleries. And I know that some distilleries don't do this. Some of them very honestly put the same into the miniatures as what you get in the full-size bottles. But I strongly suspect that some distilleries do curate what goes into the miniatures. And it makes perfect sense if you think about it, because this is the best salesman that you can get. A little bottle that costs you hopefully less than a fiver, lets you try out a whiskey before you know if you're ready to stump up the funds for a full bottle. So if someone tries this and they like it, then they could go out and buy one, two, or a whole case of the full-size bottles, and by then it's, it's too late, isn't it? And saying that, I will say that this is probably slightly better than some of the full-size bottlings that I've had. This is one that you'll quite often get as a gift. If people know that you're a whiskey drinker, then you can expect, at least a couple of times in your life, a bottle of this is going to come your way from someone that probably doesn't really know what you're going to appreciate. And Famous Gross, having such amazing brand awareness it's really penetrated the market worldwide famous gross it's going to be a lot of people's go-to whiskey and that's something that you really can't underestimate brand awareness when it comes to whiskey because whiskey has been flying high for a long time now it's probably at least as popular as it ever has been in the UK and in most countries, especially the US. And Famous Gross, 
with their red gross on the ball there probably familiar worldwide you have to say that it is a wonderful job of presentation you don't have to be a whiskey drinker to fall in love with this little guy and sort of appreciate the adverts that you see on TV and in magazines and in a way I think that's one of the most important things to us to myself and probably most of you watching as people that take your single malts quite seriously Famous Gross does more than anyone to promote whiskey worldwide better than any salesman can and it instills that idea in people's minds of whiskey and what it can be in a way I think the Famous Gross in terms of the logo and the brand it's the figurehead of the whiskey industry in terms of awareness and recognizability worldwide it's it's a bit like the Queen Queen Elizabeth II you can say what you want about the monarchy some people love them some people hate them a lot of people are fairly indifferent I think but what the Queen and the royal family does for England and the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth she is a figurehead that promotes Britishness and a certain value system across the world and obviously she brings in a lot of tourism to England and the United Kingdom and does a lot to ensure that Britain, the UK and the Commonwealth keeps that position in the minds of people worldwide and that's exactly what you get from the famous Grouse. What does that mean to us whiskey snobs? those of us who take their single malt very seriously is this a whiskey that I'm going to recommend to all of you at home? Not really like the Ballantines blend that I've reviewed recently if you add this to a big glass of ice on a hot day it's perfectly adequate, it does the job but if you want something that you're going to sit down and sip and appreciate and analyse and really get to know the flavours with, this probably is one that you can give a miss. Though, like I said, most of you have probably already tried Famous Gross in a pub or as a gift at Christmas. Because Famous Gross makes the majority of its sales around Christmas time in the UK because it is that staple of the cupboards at Christmas time and at parties and also as gifts something that is worth mentioning about Famous Gross is that it has something that a lot of whiskey distilleries have not got and would probably quite appreciate and this is very small on this tiny little miniature bottle there but hopefully you can see in the middle at the top there there is the royal coat of arms and some impossibly small text around that. By appointment to Her Majesty the Queen, Scotch Whiskey Blenders Matthew Glogue and Son Limited. So what that is, is the Royal Warrant. And that's quite a big deal for companies that are producing goods in the UK. It's not particularly clear what it means, but what that actually is, is a kind of endorsement from the Royal Family and there are very few whiskey distilleries that can boast that they have this royal warrant I believe what a manufacturer has to do to obtain a royal warrant they will agree to supply some amounts of some goods to the royal family and if the royal family feels that their brand and their goods portray a certain image and certain level of quality and trustworthiness the royal family will agree to allow the company to use the royal warrant on their products. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the Queen drinks Famous Gross, but it means that at some point someone has drunk Famous Gross at one of the royal residents. And the royals have at some, probably quite a long time, a lot of these royal warrants were granted a long time in the past they have felt that Famous Gross is something is a brand that they're okay with so other whiskey brands that 
have the Royal Warrant, you've got Chivas Regal, Ballantines, Lefroig on Isla, and Famous Gross, Johnny Walker, and I think the only other one is Royal Loch Nagar. You've now got around, I think, 100, about 120 different distilleries in Scotland, and only sort of half a dozen of them have managed to achieve this royal warrant. And out of them, you've got Royal Loch Nagar. It's a small distillery in terms of bottles of single malt that they release, but it's situated very close to Balmoral in Scotland, which is one of the residents of the royal family and has been since the times of Queen Victoria when Prince Albert and Queen Victoria visited Royal Loch Nagar and gave them the, the royal warrant in the 19th century. So that one, you could possibly say that luck of their chosen location possibly had something to do with the fact that they managed to get that royal warrant. Out of the remainder, you've got Lefroig, which has received significant public backing from the Prince of Wales, and... To his credit, the Prince of Wales makes sure that Lefroig engages in various conservation and wildlife projects on the Isle of Isla to make sure that they retain that royal warrant. And all of the other names on that list of royal warrants, including Famous Gross, there's something in common with them. They're all mass-produced blended whisky. All of the others, Chivas Regal, Ballantines, Gross and Johnny Walker, they're all blended whisky brands that don't generally produce any single malts. And I find that a bit curious. Why would it be that almost all of the known brands that produce whisky that have royal warrants, why, are, why do they tend to be mass-produced blends? It's an interesting one to think about. If you've got any ideas why that might be, let me know in the comments what you think about that one. If I'm not recommending Famous Gross to those of you out there who are looking for a good single malt, but I'm admitting that it's, um, it's something of a national institution, something that I'm quite pleased exists, and I hope that it exists for a long time. Who are Famous Gross customers? Who's actually buying this stuff? Definitely, as I mentioned before, people who add ice to their whiskey kills most of the flavour of pretty much any whiskey that you add it to. So anyone that likes their whiskey on the rocks, this is going to be popular with them. People that like their mixed drinks as well. If you're adding something to this, especially Coca-Cola or ginger wine, I actually noticed on the Tesco website, did a little price check on this, and I believe it's available for about £13 for a full bottle at the moment, which is quite staggeringly cheap. But I noticed that the other products that other people buy, you get recommended other products on their website that have also been bought alongside this, two types of ginger wine and lots of fizzy drinks. So that tells you what a lot of people who are buying this have got on their minds. So you're looking at people who want a nice, easy-going, refreshing drink, chilled, fizzy, bubbly, flavoured, something where you don't necessarily taste all or possibly any of the actual whiskey that goes in there. And it has to be said that there's nothing wrong with that. If that's your thing, it's fair enough. We all start somewhere. Some of those people might grow out of that and start to try their whiskey neat and they might move on to single malts. Some people may not, some people won't. Some people don't want to. For some people, spending 30 even £30 on a bottle of single malt is far more than they want to spend. They're either not interested in the flavours that we appreciate or they just don't know and they're happy living their lives without that. It's not something that they want to pursue. And we are in no position to tell them that what they enjoy is any different to what we do. And that really takes us on to something else that I want to talk about, something else that this little guy has inspired me to think about. 
It's whiskey snobbery. I think there's a, a tendency for anyone that enjoys the finer side of anything, whether it's food or clothes or cars or whiskey, especially single malt whiskey. At the same time as you're appreciating what you love so much about something that you're passionate about, there's a tendency to look down on things that you deem as substandard and not good enough for your refined tastes. And, like I said, whatever you enjoy, that's up to you. And if you enjoy it, then everyone should feel free to make their decisions, especially if it's something at a really good price point. All of those people that, um, and we've all been guilty of it at some point, all of those people that look down on certain whiskies, especially blends, which can be very good, as well as some that aren't so good. You have to think about what you're actually doing. When you engage in that whiskey snobbery, you are, in a way, you are making yourself feel better by making someone else feel worse. It's not really something that any of us should be doing. So, whiskey snobs out there, don't do it. We've all done it. But... We need to learn to get on, don't we? Another thing that has to be talked about is the fact that blended whiskey is, more often than not, is tends to be much younger than single malt. And the fact that a lot of grain whiskey, in the case of Famous Gross, 65% of the contents, and that's of the whiskey that's um, that's going to actually be less than that by the the fact that there's also water in here, Blended whiskey is a cheap way for distilleries and bottlers and whiskey producers to make some cash. It doesn't matter how you feel about that, that easy cash is something that can prop distilleries up and keep distilleries open. You have to remember that, especially in the 1980s, when there was a massive slump in the market for whiskey, which is caused by various things, bit of a recession going on in the 80s, a lot of people didn't have the funds to spend on luxury goods, and also white spirits, your vodkas especially, were very popular in the 1980s, which led a lot of people to not be able to afford or not want to buy the brown spirits like whiskey. And a lot of you will probably know that in the 1980s, especially 1983, whiskey distilleries in Scotland were closing all the time. In 1983, there was an average of one distillery closing every week throughout the year, including the likes of Port Ellen and Brora Distillery, which are have quite a fanatic, almost rabid following now. And both of those distilleries are planned to reopen at some point in the near future. But if you contrast that to Lagavulin Distillery on Isla, Lagavulin did not go out of business in the 1980s and one of the reasons for that was blended scotch because Lagavulin Distillery had a close relationship with White Horse Whiskey which is a brand that, at least myself, I tend not to see in the UK I'm not sure if it is still produced or not but because of this relationship that they had with White Horse which I believe was owned by the same group at the time they were able to sell a lot of their casks to White Horse for use in their blended whiskey. And that low cash flow that Lagavulin had coming in was enough to keep the distillery afloat until they pulled out of the, those bad times and they were able to start producing the single malt Lagavulins that we all know and love today. Other things that are worth mentioning is blended whiskey. If blended whiskey brands are owned by the same company as single malt distilleries, they are a convenient way for single malt distilleries to perhaps dispose of some of the less desirable casks. Apart from that, you've really only got two other options. You either stick it in your products and cope with the fact that you're turning customers off by issuing a a substandard product sometimes, or you shift it to the independent bottlers. So, what mark am I going to give this famous gross, this well-known bird? I don't think I'm going to give it a mark at all, to be honest. 
it's not the right arena to judge something like the famous gross here. Most of the people that are buying famous gross, they're not the sort of people that are going to be looking for the pinnacle of whiskey. And if they enjoy it, that's fair enough. And the people that do enjoy it, if you are looking for something to go with ice or something for your mixer, just do a little experiment here. There's a fair amount of whiskey there. Maybe even a single. I'm going to top that up. Probably an equal measure of this soft drink. It's going to give that a swirl. So immediately I can smell that this is not just a soft drink anymore. But the sweetness from the soft drink is covering up a lot of the inadequacies of a whiskey. And on the palate there, again, that sweetness is going a long way to actually accentuates and complements the whiskey really well. And I can feel a nice warming feeling because that whiskey is definitely in there, bearing in mind that this is probably a lot stronger than most people that drink whiskey and coke are going to mix their drinks. It's immediately changed it into something very different. You're getting a lot of flavours from the soft drink. If this is your thing, perfectly drinkable. So, no mark from me. Long live the famous gross. Cheers. Thank you.